and welcome to today's webinar presented by Accountants World. This is the second in a series on how to cut your client's capital gains tax cost. Today, we'll be covering legal structures for opportunity zone investing. Our host, again, will be Rakesh Bhargava, managing partner at Mango Tree Real Estate Holdings, and he'll be joined by Mark Walensky, a tax attorney. I want to thank you again for joining us today. My name is Div Bansali. I'm a vice president at Accountants World. Before we turn things over, uh, I wanted to just briefly mention a couple of things related to GoToWebinar. If you haven't used the tool recently or just need a refresher, if you don't see the GoToWebinar control panel, look for an orange arrow that'll allow you to expand or hide the attendee control panel at any time. You can check out your audio options by clicking on the audio tab. You can select computer audio or phone call. If you select phone call, it'll provide you with a dial-in number and access code. And finally, if you have any questions uh, during today's presentation, you can go ahead and type them in on the questions tab and um, go ahead and enter those. And we'll try to cover as many of those as possible at the end of this presentation. We offer half of a CP for today's webinar. Um, so if you attend all five of the CP sessions, uh, one session is not CP in this series, but the other five are. So if you attend all five of those, you can earn 2.5 CP. Uh, you need to attend the live webinar for 30 minutes, respond to both of the polling questions today, and then submit the post-webinar survey, which will show up after the webinar is ended. If you don't see the uh, post-webinar survey, no worries. We will email you a link to that as well. Um, and unlike most of our CP webinars, you won't be receiving CP confirmation right away. We're going to be waiting until all of them have taken place uh, after December 16th, and then we'll be processing all of those and, uh, and communicating with you by email at that time. Uh, if you haven't already done so, please add webinar at accountantsworld.com to your trusted email list in your email uh, system to make sure that you receive all communications from us. So at this time, before I turn it over uh, to our speakers today, I'm going to go ahead and launch the first poll question. I want to go ahead and get that up here. Uh, so you should see this in front of you. Uh, and the question is, within how many days must an individual investor invest his or her realized capital gains in a qualified opportunity zone fund. So they'll be covering that very soon um, with this sort of a pop quiz to get us started. So please go ahead and select the option that you believe is correct. Uh, make sure to click the submit button so that your vote is counted. And just a reminder that this is the first of two poll questions that we will be delivering today. And the voting in the poll questions is required in order to earn your CP. So we'll take uh, about 10 more seconds here. I see about 88% of people have voted at this point. So let's go ahead and get that as high as possible in the next few seconds here. Going once, going twice. All right, so we'll go ahead and close that out and I'll share the results here. Um, and Rakesh, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you while we, uh, while we have these up in front of us. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can you can you eyes can you see everyone can see my screen? Uh, Div, I'm not hundred percent sure. Uh, let me take a look. No, I got Don't it. See it yet. Yeah, show my screen. Yep. So everybody can see uh, the. So Mark, welcome uh, to the second in six series of Opportunity Zone Investing uh, through AccountantsWorld.com. I'm very grateful to you for being here today. So from what I understand is that not only you are an attorney, but you're also uh, on the supervising responsibility for ABA's uh, tax section comment on, on both the sets of proposed regulation. So you took a trip to, to Washington to testify, so to speak. Yes. How was that experience like? Oh, hi, Rakesh. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to everyone. Uh, I'm Mark Walensky. Yes, in February, after the comments, our comments with the American Bar Association tax section were submitted, uh, I went to Washington, D.C., representing the tax section with respect to its comments. There were 23 other speak, 22 other speakers. About five of us were there to talk uh, about technical aspects of, of these rules. The other 17, 18 were there to talk about the social impact of opportunity funds. For me, it was a wake-up call um, to the social impact arguments that people had uh, given the fact that um, 
the rules really do not require funds to certify how they're mm -hmm. investing uh, and in what kind of investments they're going to make and whether or not those are good for the local community or not. The IRS and Treasury said, well, you know, we're not, how do we, how do you want us to respond? We're here to make technical tax rules. We hear the arguments. But in fact, they did respond in various ways by making it easier, I think, for current owners of property to participate in, in these uh, opportunity zone investments. Uh, Mark, second, uh, as I was discussing with you earlier today, you also told me that last week you were again in Congress testifying, and that is not part of the Opportunity Zone per se, if I'm not mistaken, but there's something very interesting happening. In, That's right. Uh, so please share a little bit with our audience. I think this the, they probably will be hearing for the first time. Yeah. As, uh, it, Senator Wyden uh, has issued a white paper, Treat Wealth Like Wages, and you can find it on his uh, on his website, Senator Wyden of Oregon. Uh, it is essentially a, a <laughs> it, it, it creates, it creates a lot of changes to the tax rules. It mm -hmm. would be, it would treat real, it would treat death as a realization event. So there will be a one-time uh, gain recognition upon death. This has been tried previously, but it's, um, it's, it would be a massive overhaul in the way people think. And for so-called applicable taxpayers, meaning taxpayers generally with $10 million of wealth over a long period, over a three-year average, it would effectively eliminate, it would eliminate opportunity zone benefits. I, I wouldn't see how, it would require all realization events, meaning sales of investments in opportunity zone to be recognized regardless of other provisions in the code that would provide for non-recognition. So it would, uh, I can't imagine how uh, they would get that rule through without essentially eliminating the benefits of Opportunity Zone investments for uh, higher wealth investors. So Mark, now if somebody made an investment in 2018 or 2019, let's say this law is passed in 2020, would they be grandfather? Your guess, I guess. No. You. They will not be grandfather. No, of course not. So this is very scary, but let's move on. Because but it's just it's just the white paper and it's from the Senate. So there's no statutory language right now. And it is, uh, and, and who really knows how, how far these things move. But it's out there by uh, a well-respected senator. Uh, we, we label it as a potential risk and move on. So Mark, a lot of people are confused between QAF, which is Qualified Opportunity Fund, and Qualified Opportunity Zone Business Property. Can you like just give us like a 30 second or overview of what it is? Okay. A fund is generally going to be a vehicle often set up as a limited liability company mm -hmm. that accepts contributions, equity contributions from investors who've had capital gains. Qualified opportunities on business property is uh, a technical term of a type of, of property within a qualified opportunity zone that QAFs will be uh, acquiring or developing uh, and, and either directly at the, at the level of the fund, which is rare, we don't see that very often, or more likely at the level of an entity, a business partnership in which the QAF is going to invest. So either it could be a real estate or it could be a business. It could be, it, it's certainly not limited to real estate or real estate development. Okay. What are the steps or uh, how does one invest? Let's say I got a million dollar gain. I don't, but let's say I do. How do I go about doing it? It's a capital gain. All right. Putting aside the time restrictions right now, and, right. We'll, get, and we'll get there. You have capital gains, you have cash, most investments you you want to invest. So it's just another fund. You can invest in your Vanguard funds. You can invest in whatever you want. In this case, you're going to invest in a QAF, Qualified Opportunity Fund, which is, an, again, an entity set up specifically for the purpose of making investments in opportunity zones. We're seeing in broad strokes, two kinds of funds, institutional qualified opportunity funds, which are uh, large private wealth banks, uh, which are finding investments for 
basically you're going to be a, as a individual you'd be investing in these as a passive investor mm -hmm. into a uh, into a managed quaff which is like any other managed fund in this world be it uh, a REIT fund or a quaff finding suitable investments that are targeted toward social impact in some cases there are social impact quaffs there are high return high equity which some are just purely which investments are going to get us the best return on on investments and so if you if you're an investor you have so much time which we're going to hit next but you have so much time to get your money into a fund which is then going to invest all that capital it takes in from all the investors into uh, opportunity zone investments so can it be an llc or lp or c corp or s corp the fund itself yeah quite. almost all funds are going to be partnerships partnerships LLCs, yes okay great now what kind of gains qualify for these kinds of investment the irs treasury has said only capital gains um, capital gains or what are called section 1231 gains not to get too technical which are gains from sale or disposition of business property would qualify or gains from stock portfolio mm -hmm. if the the rationale behind opportunity zone investments was really to capture gains from stock uh you know congress certain people thought there was way too much money uh tied into tech and this was supposed to this was really created to uh allow tech investors to dispose of some of their equity positions and be able to defer some of that gain there is no tax benefit if you just take monies that are not associated with capital gains so if you if you had no capital gains and you just wanted to pour your life's wealth into an opportunity zone investment you get no tax benefits whatsoever notwithstanding you've just put five million dollars into an opportunity zone which could have a great impact on that community you get no tax benefits the benefits are limited to people who have capital gains so i must have a capital gain either long term or short term and i must have to i must invest it in a in fund. a particular fund in a particular census tracts right are there any irs requirement for me before i open a fund do i have to file something so in order to open a fund right now the only thing that happens is you you create the llc which is a you know a 20 minute process generally except the articles of organization for this LLC, particular llc will have special purpose language that the entity is being organized for the purpose of making investments in qualified opportunity zones. So there'll be that sort of language there. The when the fund, the LLC files its initial partnership return, it's going to file a specific form, IRS form 8996, certifying that it's just a fund. The IRS originally, like I was saying, before hearing all the comments from community groups, left it wide open and that self-certification that all you have to do is say i'm here by a fund that's it nothing more nothing less mainly because the irs needed to keep track of the timing of what you know when it became a fund so it can link to investors and whether they got it in within a 180 day deadline uh, i gave away the answer sorry uh, the irs has announced that it's going to revise the form to require more information from funds as to what they're doing. We haven't yet seen the revised draft form for 2019, mm -hmm. but uh, we it, 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 we expect the form to require a little bit more um, reporting than just saying, I'm here by a fund. So when you picked up on 180 days, that's a good point because I saw only 56% people responded correctly 180 days. But you also corrected me, it's not 180, it's 179. So talk a little bit about it's 180, but it's the date. Yes. So if an investor has uh, a gain, again, keep, well, first we'll keep it easy. Investor owns capital assets, stock in a tech company, because you know that was where it started. Obviously, you can have 
stock in any company really but you have you have capital gain on july 1 the investor has to invest in a fund has to find a fund to invest in a and b actually has to make the investment to the fund by adding cash to the fund within 180 days with that 180 day period beginning the day of the gain so if the gain was july july 1 that's day one and you count july 1 through the next 179 days mm -hmm. so okay. one on the one hand you can invest on the same day you sell you can immediately i i, I saw on july 1 i take the cash and i immediately put it into a fund but that is day one you got 179 more days after that. People who do a lot of 1031 work know that the rule is very different, uh, and it's a, it's a footfall, for, it's a trap for the unwary. In 1031, you have 180 days to replace, right. as you know, and that 180-day period begins 100 begins the next day after the sale. So for people working a lot in 1031, our 180-day clock starts. The next day, this this clock starts the day of. It's a little different. Uh, I also know you talked to me earlier about it. That if you are getting this gain through a K one or a pass through entity, you got to start counting those one eighty days from the last day of the last tax year. Am I correct? Yeah. So if you're a partner in a partnership and you're seeing a, K, a gain on the K one, often it's going to be what is called Section twelve thirty one gain, gain from the sale or disposition of property using a trade or business. Let's assume uh, there's a special rule for that kind of gain, but let's assume it's um, the partnership had stock and the partnership, it was not pro property using a trade or business, but the partnership owned stock, it was an investment company and the gain flowed through the partnership to the partner, mm -hmm. okay? And the partnership sold on July 1, keeping the same date. Let's assume, to keep things simple, that the last day of the partnership's tax year is December 31st. The partner ordinarily has 180 days from the beginning on the day, the last day of the partnership's tax year to invest. The partner now has 180 days from the last day of the partnership's tax year to invest in a fund. A lot of times, if it's a multi-member partnership, multi-partner partnership, all the partners are not going to want to put their money into opportunity zone funds. Uh, a lot of people might think these are risky investments, whatever reason, or they may have differences in which way they want to go. So you're not seeing a lot of partnerships, unless they're very much family controlled partnerships, you're not seeing a lot of partnerships uh, going in into the fund themselves. More typical is the partners are making investments and their clock starts on the last day of the partnership taxable year. However, the partner can elect to use the same 180-day clock as the partnership, which would have been the 180 days beginning July 1, which would have been the 180 days beginning on July 1. And why would that be? The partner may have an investment opportunity in August. The general default rule would have required the partner to wait all the way until the end of the partnership tax year beginning December 31st. But the rules actually allow the partner to um, the rules allow the partner to invest in the same timeline beginning July one. Right. So now we have some questions coming up. So first question is that will capital gain distributed from mutual fund qualify for QAF investment benefit? Uh, yes, it should. It should. Okay. Second question is that could you repeat the information on Senator's white paper that could impact the uh, the benefit of it. So I think we can uh, after the after the webinar is over, we'll put that down in a yeah. in an email and send it to everybody. I think it's Senator Wyden, W Y D E N. If you go on his web page, every senator has a web page. Uh, you'll find his white paper. It's called Treat Wealth Like Wages. Okay. The next question that came in, which is interesting, is that if, even if you have no gain, no benefit with the capital gain, what about tax-free gain after the holding period? So I invested regular cash. Will I get elimination of capital gain tax after 10 years? No, you will not. Uh, okay. You will not. Like I was saying earlier, just to repeat that, you can pour your entire life wealth into an opportunity into an opportunity zone investment. If it's just after tax money, you get no tax benefits for doing that. Okay. <clears throat> if I created a fund 
and if I deposited my capital gain into the fund, but I do not have a property, will I still qualify for the co-op benefits? So this gets into the timing issue. Timing issue, yes. Yes. And so, okay. So uh, it, the legal structure, if you want to switch maybe to the next slide with the picture. Okay. I think that will help. Yeah, I'll do that. All right. So, so we're organizing an entity. Right now, all we have done so far is that the investor has invested money into a fund. The fund's job now is to find suitable investments in opportunity zones. In some cases, relatively rare, because of the way the rules were written, the fund itself can go out and buy property in an opportunity zone and develop or build that property. Okay, the, the fund could go out, buy land, and construct a building on that land. Mm -hmm. This is not what funds do in the real world. We know that. Vanguard funds do not buy businesses or buy property. They, they, I'm sorry, they do not buy property and develop property. It makes no sense. And in fact, the rules weren't expecting people to do that. In fact, what the funds will do is invest the cash in portfolio companies, business entities, often referred to as QOZBs, Qualified Opportunity Zone Businesses, which themselves are struck, set up as partnerships. And those entities, the business entities, will be the ones that are buying up the land and developing it, uh, new buildings or buying existing buildings and substantially improving that property. So the timeline is, as long as the investor gets their money into the fund, great, within 180 days of the capital gain event or the last day of the partnership year or whatever rule we're talking about here, there are multiple, unfortunately it's complicated, there are multiple time rules, the, the fund has to invest the cash for all intents and purposes by December 31st of the year it receives the cash. There are, there are exceptions, there are, there's weeds here. I mean, there are a lot of weeds. Right. But let's say that by December 31st, the fund has to find suitable investments. So the fund, I'll, I'll just back up, the fund has a 90% asset test. Cash, in other words, 90% of its assets have to be good assets, which can be, include investments in business entities or investments in the property that's being developed. Assume that the fund is not going to be developing property. So the fund has to find its way, use the cash to make investments in business entities. Okay. So it has, by the end of the year, there are two testing dates, but the, rule, the Treasury regulations came out with a nice little exception that the fund can ignore cash that came in within six months uh, in terms of the first, the first measurement date. So right. even if it holds cash on the first measurement date, by December 31st, it has to, it has to use that use cash. It, right. Another question that came in is that the partners have option end of the year or 180 days. So my understanding is that 180 days from the receipt of the gain, yeah. if the partnership renounces their decision to invest, mm -hmm. if not, then they have 180 days from the date of the last year. Am I correct? The partner has 180 days. The, the partner can elect to use the partnerships to use the partnerships 180 day clock. The default rule is that the partnership's 180-day investment period starts on the last day of the partnership tax year. Tax year. Okay. Okay. All right. And let, let me just go back to that six months. Clearly, if the if the fund is, uh, you know, it gets so technical. I mean, generally, you could say December 31st. Obviously, for funds set up in the last half of the year, then you get till June 30th. Uh, to for the fund to invest the cash. Right. right. Mark, one thing I realize interacting with you is that these laws, even though they may appear very simple, there may be no reporting requirement, uh, you can self-certify it. These are very complex laws and anybody who's doing something must seriously consider consulting with a quite competent tax attorney, such as yourself, obviously, or a competent CPA, which they themselves may be, but they must be thoroughly investigated before they 
they advise the client to invest. Am I correct in that assumption? You are very correct. Um, these have been, I've done a lot of programs. I've watched a lot of programs by very high impact speakers. I have never seen so many people struggle uh, with a set of, presenting a set of rules effectively as with opportunity zones because every avenue we go down is, uh, I know it in my mind, is uh, a rule with five exceptions and five exceptions to the exception. Mm -hmm. And it's been, uh, it's, it's extremely hairy. I, I, and, and I agree with you 100%, uh, consult your tax advisor. Right. Also this- Hi folks, uh, sorry, just wanted to jump in for one minute with a quick time check. We have about five minutes left here. Um, did you want to go ahead with the next section or have me launch the second poll and then answer that question? That's perfectly fine. Okay, sounds great, thank you. So folks, I'll go ahead and launch the second poll question here. Um, and so the second one is, which form is used for a capital gain deferral election? And you see four options of forms there. Please select the one that you think is correct and click the submit button. Um, and uh, we will, uh, it, it, this is the second of today's poll questions, second of two poll questions today required for earning CP. Uh, and after we submit, we'll, uh, we'll hear from our speakers today. All right, so we're going to take about 10 more seconds here uh, for people to go ahead and vote. All right, going once, going twice. Okay, so 86% uh, of people said form 8949, Rakesh. Uh, that's awesome, that's awesome. So Mark, I mean, let me see if there are any more questions that came in while we are, uh, we talked about the realized versus unrealized, it's only realized. How long does a fund have to deploy the, the monies that are so, received? Since we are talking about the beginning stages on this program of, of funds, so the funds now have taken in $5 million from various investors, okay? The funds have a timeline to use that money. There's a 90% test for, at the fund level, all right? And that 90% is based on the average, we'll call it good assets and bad assets with cash being a bad asset mm -hmm. and good assets being either opportunity zone businesses and interests or opportunity zone property, uh, okay? So the night you look at the first measurement date, which is, I'm gonna go a little technical here, you look at two measurement dates in the, in the fund's tax year. The first measurement date being the, the last of the six, the last day of the six month period, starting from the month the, the fund certified to be a fund. Mm -hmm. If the fund certified in its initial year to be a fund in April, you'd go the last, the last, the sixth month is April, May, June, July, August, September. You look at September 30th and you say, what percentage of the funds assets are held as good interests. If it's a bunch of cash, zero. Zero percent. If it's a bunch of, if if it's if all the money has been invested, then it's a hundred percent. Okay. And then you look at the second measurement date, which is always the last day of the funds partnership year called December 31st. And let's say on December 31st, all of the money had been invested in a qualified opportunity zone business partnership. All right. Fortunately, for the fortunately, funds can ignore cash that came in for this purpose on the first measurement date. It can ignore cash that came in within six months of that measurement date. So even though it's zero because it's only holding cash, I I only make sure that by December 31st the fund has invested in a business partnership. Now I want that was a fund organized and start, which started on the first day, uh, with, on the first half of the year. If the fund was organized and certified on the second half of the year, then you're gonna have a little bit different rule. Ultimately, you look at the December 31st is gonna be the first measurement date. And the second measurement date will be the next year, June 30th. The fund can ignore the cash rule 
on its first measurement date, December 31st. So as long as by June 30th, the following year, the fund has invested in business entities that are doing in business in an opportunity zone, the fund will pass the test. Well, Mark, thank you so much. Um, I do realize based on this answer you gave us that IRS is trying its best to be as friendly as they can be, right. given the, the rules that have been given to them by the Congress. And, and thanks to people such as yourself who have devoted a lot of time and effort and testifying in front of Congress and IRS to make these rules better and easier for investors. I also appreciate everybody who attended today's webinar and uh, wish they, they can go to their, their clients and have them invest money because this is one of the best things that our country has experienced it. I also want to thank Dev. Um, I also want to thank uh, Sharon who put it all together, Barka, my associate. And Mark, I hope in future, if you have another webinar, we'll probably do for an hour, but have you come with some specific topics and maybe drill deeper into it for the benefit of the accountants world community. Absolutely. All right. Thank okay. you so much. I really appreciate it. That sounds great. Sounds great. Thank you Thank both, you both uh, so much for the conversation, conversation today. That was really our next, our next webinar, webinar, webinar in our series, series to is to today in the report for the topic of topic accounting and tax consideration is very best in this community. So, 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 so please, please join us, join us that day as well. As well, as well, as well. Hopefully we'll sign up for all six of the sessions that you're not sure if you have. You can email us at marketingaccountingsworld.com and we can confirm that for you. So we look forward to seeing you in two weeks, two days, same time time for sessions in this series. Thank you again to our speakers today.